Hey guys, my name is Trevor Sullivan and welcome back to my video channel. If you recall from our last video on Rust programming, you probably know that we covered the basics of creating a closure and then spawning additional threads using that closure, which is essentially an anonymous function that we hand off to the threading module in the Rust standard library. And we let that threading module go off and execute these separate threads based on the function definition of our closure. Now, in that earlier video, there's an important concept that we didn't actually cover, which is how to pass data from the outer scope or whatever function is causing the spawning of those threads into the thread itself or into the closure itself. Now, if you go back to my video playlist on the Rust programming tutorial here, one of the earlier videos that we covered is understanding Rust closures here. And you might know that one of the unique capabilities of closures versus named functions in Rust modules is that closures can actually capture the data from the parent scope and actually access and borrow values from the parent scope very easily. So we're going to take a look at how to do that first, but then after we take a look at passing data from that parent scope into a thread, we're actually going to look at how to solve for a lifetime problem by borrowing values inside of a thread from the parent scope and then returning control of that borrowed value back to the parent scope rather than destroying access to that variable altogether. So we're going to be sticking around in the thread module here, which again is part of the Rust standard library. You don't have to install any extra crates to get access to this. We're going to be using a function down here that's directly exported by the thread module called the scope function down here. And the scope function is how we initialize a new scope. We can create a new closure, passing in that scope, and then we can use that child scope to actually spawn additional threads. And one of the interesting things about these scopes that we're going to be talking about is that the scope actually guarantees that all threads will be joined. And if you remember from the previous video that we did on the introduction to threading, when we join a thread, to the main function or the main thread, essentially what we're doing is we're telling our main thread that we want to halt execution until our child threads that we've joined have completed their execution so that we can continue on doing additional data processing. But when we use scopes, that joining is automatically handled for us by the scope itself. But let's start out by understanding some of the issues that we run into when we start to borrow data inside of threads. And before we get into the video, I just wanted to remind you to head to my ch channel at youtube.com slash Trevor Sullivan. Since I'm an ind independent content creator, it really helps me a lot if you subscribe to the channel, leave a like on this video if you've learned anything new, and leave a comment down below just to let me know what you thought of this particular video. And again, make sure that you go through the entire Rust programming tutorial playlist, which is featured on the homepage of my channel, and that'll help you to learn more about Rust programming fundamentals. All right, so what we're going to do is go into our sample project here, and we previously had created this source file called mythreads.rs. We created a couple of test functions in here just to understand how to spawn additional threads right here. And then we waited for those threads to finish by either checking for the is finished Boolean value, or we could use the join handle to actually join the thread and wait for it to finish. But this time we're going to actually pass some data into a child thread and take a look at how borrowing and lifetimes work inside of our child threads. So I'm going to actually create a new file here called mysCopedThreads.rs. And inside here, we're going to create a sample that is going to have a public function. And we're going to say test thread variables for starters. And inside of this test thread variables function, we are going to take a look at a simple example of spawning a thread and just referencing data from the parent scope, which is going to be this function right here itself. So variables that we declare inside of this function scope, we want to be able to access in the child threads. So let's say for starters that we just have a simple value, something like let uh, maybe age 
equal 34, okay? And let's say that somewhere inside of our function, we just wanna print out the age that's been declared in the parent scope. Now, if you're familiar with the Rust variable ownership model, you may know that when you declare a variable, the current scope has ownership over that variable. So right now, this variable called age, which is an integer value, is currently owned by the function test thread variables. And if we want to use that value in a different scope, then we have to borrow that value from the current scope and then pass that borrowing uh, kind of pointer, so to speak, into the child scope. And then that will allow us to reference that value from the parent scope. So let's create a simple closure here that says, let's do let print age equal a closure. And then we'll just say print line, your age is, and then we'll print out age. Okay. So let's put a semicolon right there at the end. And then we'll do thread and we'll do spawn and we'll spawn the print age closure there. And then at the very end, we'll just do a dot join as well to make sure that we wait until it's finished. And then right down here, we'll just say finished printing age just as a little diagnostic there. And so now what we wanna do is go back to our main function. So in VS Code, I'll do control P and look for my main.rs file here. Let's go up to our module declarations here and say pub mod and my scoped threads. And then down here in our main function, we'll just do my scoped threads, double colon test thread variables. So this is a little bit different from our earlier example, because in this case, we are trying to use a variable from the parent scope inside of the child scope. And that's something that we just didn't do before. In our previous examples of threading, just to take a look at this really quick, any variables that we declared inside of the closure are simply scoped to the closure itself. This X variable that we declare in the closure isn't being used anywhere in the parent scope. And so, Basically, when we kick off spawn thread right here, we create this closure. The closure defines its own internal value here. And so there's no problem with that, right? Because this closure owns the variable X. And so it can mutate X all it wants to without affecting the parent scope. But this is different here with the example that we just created because we declare this variable that's owned by this scope right up here, but then we reference that in a read-only sense, so in an immutable sense inside of this scope here. So if we go to standard thread spawn, that should fix that reference issue there. And now you can see it says closure may outlive the current function, but let's go to problems here, but it borrows the age variable here. So essentially what this error is saying is that this closure right here is being kicked off asynchronously by a thread right here. And this thread, if we did not join the thread from our main thread, then this thread could continue running out there and our main thread could continue executing some other code, right? Now we know that we joined it here, so we know that age is still gonna be valid in the current scope here, but the compiler doesn't necessarily know that. So one of the things that we can do to solve this is actually recommended by the compiler. I think if I go to problems here, it actually says to force the closure to take ownership of the age variable, what we can do is use a, let me just copy this into a new window here so we can read it. And it says, use the move keyword. So the compiler is actually giving us the solution right inside of our errors here. So what we can do, if you read the documentation for closures, so if you go to Rust book closures and read about anonymous functions, somewhere in this documentation, it actually talks about using the move keyword right here. And this will allow you to actually move variable references from the parent scope into the child scope. And again, that's consistent with what the compiler is already telling us to do directly inside of our IDE. So if we just put this move keyword right before our closure definition, that tells the Rust compiler to take this variable that's been defined at the parent scope and move the reference into the child scope, which is the closure. And as you can see, as soon as I save this file right here, we resolve this issue.
But let me just assign this result to a variable so it starts complaining here. So I'll say let underscore result equal that. And I'm not going to read result at all. So the reason I'm putting an underscore right before the variable name is because I'm never going to read the value. And if you use an underscore at the beginning, the Rust compiler will not throw any warnings that you haven't used the variable. If I remove that underscore, you can see it complains and it says that I haven't actually referenced this variable anywhere. So if you're if you know that you just want to capture that value and then discard it, you can just use an underscore as a prefix for the variable name. So as you can see, this is compiling just fine, at least in our editor here. And sure enough, it says your age is 34. So what's happening here is that when we use this move keyword, we're basically telling the compiler to take this integer value, which is one of the primitive data types in the Rust language, and simply move that value of 34 into our child closure here so that we can access it from our child thread in our Rust program here. Now let's try something else with a custom data structure. So I'm gonna create a struct here called person and we'll just keep it private because we're just gonna be using it from the same module. And then we'll give it a first name field and we'll set it to a capital string value here. And then in our test thread variables here, we'll go ahead and create a person. So we'll say let person zero one equal person. And then we'll just do first name is a string from a string literal, which we'll just do uh, Trevor. All right, and then we'll put a semicolon at the end. So we've constructed a person. And let's do print line, your name is, curly braces, and then we'll pass in person zero one dot first name. All right, now when I save this here, let's see if this works okay. And sure enough, once again, it works perfectly fine here. Now, things get a little bit more hairy when you start to try to reference a value after you have called the move keyword for the closure. Because what the move keyword is doing is it's telling the closure right here to capture these variables that we have right up here. So let's take both of these print line statements and instead of just putting them in the closure, let's actually put them somewhere in the function's parent scope that the closure was instantiated in by the thread here. So after we spawn the thread, let's say that we wanted to reference these values age and person dot first name. Well, due to Rust's ownership rules, we actually have a problem here, and this is what scoped threads is gonna help solve. So I'm kind of setting things up here to take a look at why we want to use scoped threads. So just keep that in mind. So right down here, we've got age, we're not getting any kind of error on age, and that's because age is a primitive type in Rust. It's allocated on the stack instead of the heap. And because the Rust compiler is very efficient with creating values on the stack, this integer 32 value can simply be copied in a high-performance manner onto the stack again inside of this closure here. And that way, the closure can still have a reference to age and our parent scope can retain its reference to age here. But for other types that are being allocated on the heap instead, which is lower performance than the stack, you can see that our custom data structure down here that has our first name field, this is complaining because it is borrowing a value that has been already moved into a different scope and then subsequently destroyed. So what's happening here is with this move keyword, we are literally moving ownership of this variable person01 into the closure scope here, and that's causing the parent scope to completely lose access to that value. So anytime that we try to use this person01, even before we spawn the thread, right, it doesn't have to occur after spawning the thread. It could actually occur before spawning the thread, but any time after this closure itself has been declared with the move keyword, then our parent scope, this function right up here called test thread variables, has completely lost ownership of that person zero one variable. So now that the closure has ownership of it, when the closure's scope terminates on this curly brace here, the variable and the underlying data that that variable points to has been completely destroyed. And now our parent scope can't access that missing data any longer. And that's where this error message comes into play. So if we go to problems here, 
take a look at the error right here. It says borrow of moved value because it is of type string and it doesn't have a copy trait allowing the Rust compiler to copy the data like we have with the integer 32, which can be copied. So integer 32 is copied into the child scope, but our custom data structure can't be copied into the child scope here. So what we can do to solve this is to actually use borrowing along with scoped threads. So let's check out exactly how this is going to work. So back over in the documentation for scoped threads here, you can see that we call the scope function, which is again directly exported by thread, and then we pass in a closure, and that closure accepts a scope as its input. And it declares two different lifetimes here. Generally, you don't really need to worry too much about the lifetimes, but it does pass in a child scope pointer so that we can use that child scope to create threads instead of the thread spawn function that is also directly exported right here. So scope and spawn are kind of sister functions, but the scope creates a child scope. And then instead of calling spawn at the thread module level, we actually are going to be calling the spawn function on the scope itself. So be, pay very close attention to the code here because we're not going to use thread spawn. We're going to use scope spawn. All right, so let's transform our example here a little bit to turn this into something that actually works. So what we're gonna do is go into our closure definition right here. We can see that we're referencing a value type and a pointer type here. And what we want to do is to basically take this closure, but wrap it up into a scope. So actually we don't really need to change anything about the closure at the moment. We'll see what we need to change in just a second here. But let's comment out the thread spawn. And then we're going to do std thread to get the thread module. And then we're going to use the scope function with a lowercase s. There is a type in there called a capital S scope, but that's a data structure. And in order to get a scope, we actually use the lowercase s scope function here. And then this is what takes in another closure that passes in the scope itself. So we're going to be dealing with two different closures. The internal closure is going to be the thread code that we actually want to execute. And the outer closure is what's creating the scope itself. So when we instantiate the scope, we create a child closure here. Let's put a semicolon at the end there. And inside of this closure right here, inside of these curly braces, we are going to kick off our threads inside of this child scope, right? So this variable that gets passed into the child closure for constructing a scope can actually be used inside of this closure. So we'll do scope dot, and then you'll see that the spawn function here is available directly on that scope type. So what we're going to do is actually pass in our closure right up here called print age into scope.spawn. So we're not calling thread spawn anymore as a function of the module. We're calling the spawn function as a member of the scope type that's constructed as part of this scope function here. So now when we do scope.spawn, that is going to execute everything inside of this child scope right here and watch what we can do. So because we're getting this borrowing issue right here, what we want to do is have the, the function right here called test thread variables. We declare person01 at this scope, right? And we want this scope to keep access to person01 because we need to be able to access person01 after our thread executes, right? So let's move this kind of down here where it says your age is X and your name is Y. And now, in order to solve this borrowing issue, what we can do is go into our closure that's executing a thread, and we can put an ampersand right in front of this variable here so that we can borrow the value from the scope and then return control of it back to our parent scope. Now, it looks like we're still getting an error here, so let me see what is going on. All right, so the one other thing that I almost forgot to do right here is that in order for us to continue accessing the value person zero one, or I should say the variable person zero one, after we create the closure here and kick off the thread, is we actually need to remove the move keyword. So we no longer want to move ownership of person zero one 
into the child closure. Instead, we remove the move keyword and then we simply create the reference, an immutable reference to person01.first name. And that way the closure can access the value, but we retain ownership of the person01 variable at the parent scope, right? So now after we define the closure and execute the thread right down here, the parent scope still has access to person first name, and we didn't have to make a copy of that data in memory in order for the child closure here to access it, right? We're still pointing to the same data. We're just borrowing access to that data inside of the closure while we kick off this separate thread down here. Now, remember that scopes also automatically join threads. So in this particular case, you can see I'm doing scope.spawn, but I'm never doing a dot join operation here. And you do have the option of using join if you want to. In fact, if you want to catch any panics that occur in the child threads, then you actually have to call join here so that you can appropriately handle the panics with the result object but you don't have to do that. By simply spawning a thread inside of a thread scope, you can actually avoid the need to manually join because it's just done automatically for you by the scope struct itself. So let's go ahead and try to run this and see if it actually works. And what I'm gonna do is say print line, this is the child closure here, just so that we can see which code is coming from the child closure and which is not. So as you can see, it says, this is the child closure. Your age is 34. Your name is Trevor. And then we get that exact same data again from the main thread because control of these variables never actually left the main thread. Well, in the case of age, it actually got copied into the closure down here, but person zero one is literally just being referenced by using the ampersand borrow operator for Rust. So this is a really nice example of showing how we can take data that's been allocated on the heap. We can allow the scope to control access to that data temporarily, but ownership of the data isn't actually being passed into that child closure. And this gives you a lot more flexibility in how you implement threads and move data around inside of memory within your Rust applications. So feel free to try scopes. You can also call spawn multiple times inside of here. So if we wanted to, you know, we could call three different spawns here and each time we're just spawning a new thread within the scope. Also, one thing just to prove that this is actually working correctly, we'll say giving control back to main thread. And if we do cargo run, you can see this is the child closure, this is the child, this is the child, because we ran it three times. But then everything's running synchronously here because join was called on all those threads. But then at the very end, after the main thread has control again from the scope, you can see that control is given back to the main thread and we still have access to that data that's been declared in the parent scope. So using the pointer right here, or the borrow operator, helps you to reference data. Of course, remember to remove the move keyword if you've decided to use that, and then use the scope type here to wrap your threads, and you'll still be able to access your data later on. So I hope this gives you a better understanding of how threading works in the Rust language and how you can use borrowing in order to gain access to data defined in the parent scope of your threads closures. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Please remember to like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below and let me know your thoughts on this video and my entire playlist on Rust programming. Take care.